Good morning. My name is David Hay and it's my privilege to be able to talk to you guys um, about fire, in particular why you want to be on fire. I apologise for the awful pun. This is actually recording. At the moment it's about two o'clock in the morning in New Zealand, so the organisers have very kindly allowed me to make a recording rather than asking me to wake up at, uh, at that hour. So my name is David Hay. Um, I am a medical doctor. I'm an ex-medical doctor, in fact. I haven't practiced for a number of years. I currently serve as the Chair Emeritus of HL7 New Zealand. I'm co-chair of the Fire Management Group. My full-time day job is as a product strategist for Orion Health. And I blog extensively on fire at fireblog.com, as well as being the author of some of the tooling that we'll touch on in this presentation. And my goal for this presentation is to so that you understand what the basics of fire are actually are, and also ideally that you want to find out more. I've only got about half an hour, so that's nowhere near enough to give you an in-depth uh, in description, but hopefully enough to get you going. So here are the things we're going to talk about today. We'll touch on what fire actually is. We'll spend a wee bit of time talking about the models themselves, which are, of course, the resources. Uh, we'll talk about terminology and how fire interacts with terminology, uh, like snowmed and such like. We'll touch on profiling, which is how you adapt fire to your particular needs. We'll spend a wee bit of time talking about exchanging resources, paradigms of exchange, how we actually move resources from one system to another. We'll talk about some tools, and then we'll talk about fire enabling your application. What are the sort of ways you could use fire in your own application? And touching on uh, migrating off some of the other standards. So let's get started. So, first question of course is, why did fire come about in the first place? Well, HL7 is a standards um, uh, description, sorry, standard definition organisation that de defines a number of interoperability standards. It defines other standards as well, but it's the actual seven uh, interoperability standards that it is best known for. And in around about 2011, the board of HL7 had a meeting at which they noticed a number of things. The first thing was that the actual requirements for interoperability are increasing. Uh, and in particular, there was a need for real-time access via a real-time API. This was being driven particularly by the increase in mobile applications that were out there. They noted that there was a vast increase in the amount and the type and the source of the data, again being driven by things like devices and device applications, and also newer technologies such as genomics, which were coming on the scenes. They noticed other uses for data, not just for the delivery of healthcare, things like analytics, things like population health. And then finally, there was this, this, this topic of implementer expectations. As more and more implementers start to develop health applications, they expect a modern standard. And quite frankly, the existing HL7 standards really weren't, weren't up to scratch. And so a fresh look was needed at, at how HL7 would manage interoperability. And this was led by a very clever chap called Graham Grieve, who's an Australian, um, and he looked outside of healthcare. So this is quite an amazing thing, really. He said, well, look, we're not the only people that need to exchange data. How do other people do it? Uh, and he came across a company actually called 37 Signals, and they had a RESTful interface, or a real-time interface. And he, he modelled fire very much on some of, uh, some of the lessons which, which other, other systems uh, had, had defined. So here's a quick overview of what FHIR actually is. So FHIR stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. Fast being that we want to try and do quick implementations, we want to be able to design and deploy applications as rapidly as possible. Healthcare, because that's really all that FHIR is, is focused on. Interoperability being the major uh, purpose for FHIR. It's, it's not the sole one anymore, it's kind of moved on a bit since then, but nevertheless interoperability is very important. And resources, which we'll talk about further, being the, the core components of FHIR. It's also important to appreciate that FHIR covers off many other areas, such as workflow, such as decision support and clinical reasoning, and much more. So it's actually grown quite a lot over you know, the three or so years that it's been in, um, it's, it's been in use. Another key component of FHIR is the use of consistent and simple-to-use uh, resources, which, which really represents the content model. And as I say, we'll talk about this in just a second. Um, a, key, a key 
um, part to understand here is that the way we design resources is we want to keep them small and understandable. So rather than sort of having the concept of trying to fit every possible thing that you might possibly want into a resource, we, we do it the other way around. We sort of say, well, if, if, in fact, we call it the 80% rule in the, in, in the early days. We say that if most people are sharing a particular item of information, it makes its way into the content model. Otherwise, there is a well-defined mechanism for extending resources. It supports all paradigms of exchange, real-time APIs, documents, again, we'll touch on those, very much designed with implementers in mind. So the specification is detailed, it's online, it's fully hyperlinked. Now, you may, not, may think that's not all that much, but this is actually new in healthcare. Um, to actually be able to go to a browser and look up and follow through links is, was, actually, was actually revolutionary for FHIR. There are freely available specifications. You don't need to belong to HL7 to use FHIR, although there are good reasons for doing so. There's free tooling, there's free servers, there's libraries available to assist you. And so FHIR has had very strong endorsement and support from, from a number of, of sectors, from, from, from the vendors, from the providers, from the regulatory community, for example, the NHS in the UK into Ropen, Project Argonaut in the US. And finally, there is a massive supporting community around FHIR. It is uh, quite possible to get an answer to a question literally within minutes if you need to ask. And I'll have a, at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll have a list of the various way, places you can go to to get more help. Here's the specification. Now, this is actually the draft specification for version 3 of the spec, which is that um, link at the top there, Jan index HTML, to the top right uh, where it says HL7 org fire. That's the main home uh, for fire. If you go there today, you will see version 2, but I'm showing you version 3 because we're, we're literally only a couple of weeks away now from releasing that. And you can see the breadth. So if you start at the top there with a, what we call level 1, there's the basic framework upon which the specification is built. Uh, and that's where you have your documentation, the definition of, the, of how you actually uh, represent resources in XML and JSON, the RESTful API, how to do search, the data types and extensions and so on and so forth. So they're the basics. The next level are some of the, the supporting artifacts. So this is where we have the conformance resources, for example, which actually define what a, uh, what a resource looks like and what your own resource looks like, terminology, privacy, security, and so forth. And then level three, we start to bring into sort of more healthcare domain resources, being patient, practitioner, and so on and so forth. Level four, we start to get even more clinical uh, with, with allergies and with workflow, with financial and such like. And then finally, level five down there, clinical reasoning. And this is where we're getting into the decision support and the clinical quality measures and such like. So the takeaway I'd like to, I'd like to leave you with from this slide is, is the breadth of fire. So let's talk about resources. What exactly are resources? So as we've talked about uh, so far, they are the content model. It's the thing that we're actually moving around. And it doesn't really matter how you move it around. The resources remain the same. Again, this is something we'll touch on a little bit later on, but it is an important point. Um, you know, no matter how you actually acquire a, a particular uh, resource, uh, you can package it up in whatever, whatever way you need to do so. And it's very important to appreciate that the design of the resources is informed by a lot of work both inside and outside of HL7. In particular from version 2 of HL7, which is a highly successful standard and wide use today, but also version 3 and CDA have contributed, and other standards development organisations, in particular OpenAir, uh, CIMI, ISO 13606, IHE, DICOM and so forth. These are all organisations within which the, the FHIR community is actively liaising. And we very much see ourselves as part of that community. We're not in competition. We're all trying to do the same sort of thing. So here's an example of some of the resources that you might see. These are some of the clinical resources. Uh, I won't go through them in, in detail, but I like to point out two things uh, when I show this particular slide. The first is that when you look at a resource, you can tell pretty quickly exactly what it is trying to represent. So if you see something that looks like procedure, for example, again, you know you're talking about, well, a procedure, um, a care plan over there, a specimen and so forth. So it's almost self-defining in terms of the names of the resources. And the converse holds true. You know, if you are looking for a, a resource to represent a prescription, you've got medication order. Uh, if you're looking for a resource to represent an immunization, you've got some 
an immunization resource. So we try to make it as simple to use as possible, particularly for people who aren't deeply in the health domain. And I just want to touch on the concept of what we call the, the, the maturity model. So as I touched on earlier, uh, this is uh, we're coming up to the third version of FIRE now. And the way that we are organizing it is that we have the concept that each resource has a particular level of maturity, similar to the CMM concept. And there's a, there's a well-defined way of defining what maturity level something is. But the idea is that the more mature uh, a resource is, the less likely it is to change over time. At the moment, we're in what's called a standard for trial use phase, which means that we believe the resources are, are good enough for production use. And indeed, there are a large number of applications worldwide using fire. But because it's still being developed, it still can change. So you, when you develop and when you use fire, you do need to be aware that there are changes coming up. And this is a good and a bad thing. The, the good thing is that it gives you the ability to contribute back to fire. The bad thing, of course, is that it is change. But nevertheless, um, these are the resources. This is the content model for fire. Here is what you will see when you look at it in the specification. Uh, this is the patient resource here, as you can see. And so we, we have a number of representations. This is the one I find the most useful. And you can see we've got a patient resource, and you can see the various elements that can be in patient, identifier, whether a patient's active, name, so on and so forth. And then in that column that's labeled type, this is the data type. And a data type is a, is a key concept in FHIR. We don't have time to talk about it now. Uh, some of them are fairly simple, like an identifier or a date or a code. Others become a lot more complex, like, like a human name, which can be made up of a first name and a last name and a suffix and so on and so forth. Fully hyperlinked. Uh, and I'll also draw your attention to, to where it says gender. And you'll see over on that right-hand side there, uh, administrative gender. So simply by clicking on that link will take you immediately to the possible set of values for gender. Again, emphasizing this ease of use. Here's an example of a resource. This is a patient resource. Um, and it, it calls out the four main parts of any resource. So at the top there in green is the identity of the resource, how you actually find and refer to it, and metadata such as when it was last updated or security privacy tags and so on and so forth. The next block, uh, labeled text, that, that sort of purplish block, is the human readable summary. Now all resources in FHIR can have a human readability summary. This is what we call the lesson of CDA, where if you can at least exchange information that a human can read, you're one step along the path, and then you can incrementally bring in more structured and coded data and improve the, the quality of your interactions. I'm going to jump down to the bottom one for a moment. That's where the uh, starts off with identify. That's the structured data. That's what you saw in the previous slide. So these are the predefined terms uh, for any particular resource inside of FHIR. And then jumping back up to that third box labeled extension, here is where you see uh, the ability to add those elements that you need which aren't in common use. So for example, in New Zealand, we have the concept of, of, of a tribal affiliation for the local Maori. Uh, we call that iwi and hapu. So we would create extensions for those concepts uh, so that they're not sort of in the main specification, but they're easy to see and easy to understand. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact that that extension has a URL. And that URL in turn points to the definition of what that extension means. So this is about how if you receive a resource and it has an extension that you don't understand, you can always go away and find out what it actually means. And there are a number of rules around that that's, uh, that we can talk to. Here's another key concept. This is the ability for resources to reference other resources. So a single resource on its own is useful, but not all that useful. It's when you can create these, this network, this graph of interrelationships, that FHIR really starts to become powerful. And you can see here that the center resource is a procedure, and then to the top there is a subject, which is a patient. Down the bottom right hand is the performer, which is a practitioner, and so forth. So we can use these linkages between resources to tell our clinical story. And here's an example of that. So this is a, a consultation. It's a, a primary care type consultation. A 12-year-old boy presenting with pain in the, in the right ear. Uh, diagnosis of hepatitis media, prescription of amoxil, or amoxicillin. And then following up with, a, with an itchy rash, which is diagnosed as, a, um, as an allergy. And you can see how in this, this narrative text, we've, we've, we've colored the bits with, that you'd use a, um, uh, a resource to represent. So the, the green 
color, for example, as a condition, the patient themselves as, as the patient, and so on and so forth. And what you can do is by breaking down the actual textual, the narrative part, if you like, of the consultation, such as this, you now start to get a much more structured and a much more coded way of representing your data. Now, I don't want to go into the details of this, and indeed it's it's pretty much it's an example rather than absolutely the same, but you can see that at the top there that pain in the right ear, it's green, so it's a condition. You can see that to the left there it links to the encounter, so you know, you know when that was actually reported, and then across the right there is the the asserter. So what that is saying is that the patient is the one who said that they had pain in the right ear. Uh, and equally with the elevated temperature, the patient said they had an elevated temperature, whereas the third one down there was performed by the practitioner. So what you see are those very explicit links between resources. Another key part of FIRE is that these links are explicit, they are not implicit. If you're familiar with CDA, for example, you might be familiar with the uh, idea of context conduction where you can sort of infer things like, like who is the patient. In FIRE we don't do that, in FIRE we have definite links to them. And if you look at this graph, you can imagine that if we're capturing data in this very structured uh, manner, it's going to make it a lot easier to, to, to bring in those secondary uses, to bring in the decision support, or the population analysis and so on and so forth. So this ability to, to link resources is crucial and important. I want to touch on coded data types just for a second. We have actually three and a half um, data types which are coded. There's the code data type, which we tend to use for structural things, such as you know the status of something. Um, uh, we then have the coding element, and the coding element is one that links to an external terminology. And you can see in the example there, we have the system, which in this case is Rx norm. We have the code, which is the code within that system. And then we have the display, which is how that uh, terminology describes that concept. And then the third sort of coded data type is the codable concept. And this is the one that you're most commonly going to see inside of FHIR. And you can see that it actually incorporates the coding data type. And so this allows you to take a single thing that you are trying to represent, like asthma, uh, and represent it in a number of different terminologies if you need to. This is very, very handy, particularly if you're trying to normalize across terminologies. It's not a simple thing, but it's something which you commonly want to be able to do. And you can see it brings in the context of text. So that's where, you know, you might have, again, my example of asthma being a diagnosis. Hopefully it is, uh, it is coded, um, but if for any reason it can't be, you can at least put the human narrative in there. You can at least say what, what the doctor or what the patient asserted, which they actually had. That, you know, one step on the way to, uh, to interoperability. And FHIR interacts very well with external terminologies, and this is the mechanism by which it by which it does so. So you start out with a uh, with a code system of some sort. So this is something which has a set of concepts, um, which is coherent in and of itself. Uh, these are examples. SNOMED CT, for example, is the most common one. But we also have LOINC. We have RX Norm in the US. ICPC Read. You could have drug formularies, or and you can even have your own code systems if you want to. FHIR. SQ3 supports the concept of custom uh, custom code systems. And you then have this, it's, it's a resource, you then have the resource called a value set. And what the value set does is the value set selects a subset from the code system for some particular purpose. So for example, suppose you were writing an ED or an emergency system, A&E, uh, I'm not quite sure what you call it in the UK. You know, there might be a certain set of, uh, of SNOMED codes that you use most frequently. They won't be the only ones, but they'll be the most common ones. So the value set can then be used to say, well look, out of a whole of SNOMED, here are the ones that I'm most commonly going to see in an ED system. And the value of that, of course, is that you can then use that uh, that value set to, uh, to to help data entry, for example, or to help the consistent coding of of, uh, of diagnoses. And you then have a profile. You then have a definition from within a particular resource which binds to that value set. So uh, let's use the example of the condition resource. The condition uh, resource has got a code element, and that code element is of data type codable concept. Uh, and this, in turn, can then bind through a value set to the code system. So that's how you could have a profile on condition, which is most useful in an ED situation. 
And then you have an actual resource instance, which it still refers to that code system. So inside of that, you know, a single patient's diagnosis, it's going to have a reference to the SNOMED code system, but it can also claim to be conformant to your profiles. Profiles are actually one of the really important uh, aspects of FI, though, as you can see, there are a number of them, but profile is, is one that, that I'd really I'd really like to get across. We have we don't have time to talk about it in detail. I'll touch on it in just a minute. Um, but it's something which is actively occurring in a number of jurisdictions, including the UK, and it's something I'd, I would urge you to become uh, involved with. And indeed, profiling. So profiling is about wanting to be able to use FHIR in a number of different contexts, but to use the same set of resources. And the example which I was using before, the condition resource, is, is a good one because we want to be able to use a condition resource for general practice, for emergency care, for intensive care, for community care. And all of those, uh, all of those different domains, if you like, have got slightly different requirements for condition. They want to collect you know, potentially different things. Um, so, so a profile is to be able to describe that usage based on that context, and in particular, to be able to do this in a structured way so that you can actually, uh, a computer can understand and could potentially modify its user interface to suit a particular uh, area where it is being used. We want to be able to publish these things in a repository and find them. And as you can see, use it as the basis for, for validation, for generation of code, for UI, and indeed the, the ClinFire tooling, which I will talk about in just a second, is an example of an application that can read a profile and then generate a user interface that, that uh, reflects that, that profile. And there's three main aspects to profiling. The first is constraining a resource. So that's taking something out that we don't want to use or changing multiplicity of something. You know, maybe uh, like in a patient, for example, you can have multiple names. You might want to say, I only want one name. And you might want to fix particular values. So again, uh, in, a, in a patient identifier, you might want to say, I want to use the NHS number. And then you might want to change coded element binding. As we've talked about just before, we might want to be able to say in our profile that here is a particular subset of SNOMED that we are most interested in. And then the third aspect, and possibly the most uh, commonly used one, is the ability to add a new element. So that's to be able to say, for example, in the, in the example I gave on, on patient earlier on, in New Zealand, we want to be able to indicate hapu and iwi. Now that's of no use in the UK, uh, but you may well have your, in fact, you will have your own particular items that you want to be able to record. So what profiling is all about is adapting fire for particular specific scenarios. Here's an example of the sort of thing you can do with profiling. You could limit a name to, to just one, and you could make it required. You could do the same for identifier. You could, uh, you could in your profile, indicate that the NHS number is the identifier to use, and you must have at least one. Uh, you might want to use a different value set for marital status. You might want to say that well, you, we don't support photos. And we might want to add an extension for ethnicity. When you look at the spec, you will actually, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to say, gosh, all of these things are missing. And as I talked about before, that is deliberate. That's part of keeping the resources as simple and easy to use as possible, yet making it possible to add your own, your own bits. Let's talk about exchanging fire. We think of four different paradigms of exchange. So RESTful is the real-time API, documents um, such as the discharge summary, messages such as a lab result, and services such as a terminology lookup. Let's talk briefly about each of those. So the RESTful API is the real-time API. It's very, very commonly used outside of healthcare, uh, and it allows, yeah, mobile is, is, a, is a really good use of this, and there's a lot of tooling and a lot of experience that's available in, in a RESTful API. So that's one of the paradigms of exchange, and it's the one that's been most exercised in fire so far because that's where the gap was that's where fire kind of came in documents and messages uh, as i've said a good example of that is a discharge summary or a referral letter or a progress note um, and the way that you do documents and messages inside a fire is that you take those same resources that that, that we use here's an example of the uh, of the encounter that we looked at just before and you package it up into a bundle and you put a particular resource in this case a composition at the top which represents the specific data in this case about a document so here is an example of where you've got the same resources which you have used potentially in a restful environment and you're using them again in a document 
services and operations are for more complex uh, requirements, um, such as decision support, uh, immunization protocols, and so forth. Again, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into these in, in detail. Um, maybe we could organize something where we have a little bit more time. But really, this is the point that I want to get across, is that regardless of the paradigm, regardless of the way in which you want to exchange uh, data, the actual content is exactly the same. So you can get a resource from a from a message. Maybe it's a it's, it's a, a lab result. You could get a resource from a restful interface. Perhaps it's a nurse entering a a blood pressure or a temperature on the ward. Save those in a in a repository, and then combine them into say a document, which could be your discharge summary. So, regardless of paradigm, the content, the resources are the same. Ones. And that's really important moving forwards because mapping between different representations is always an area where you can get yourself into trouble. Touching on some of the tooling that's available, ClinFire is a tool. There's the URL down there. This is it's an open source tool. That's one that I'm responsible for. Um, it's developed particularly as a training tool that starts to help people understand how Fire actually works. It's an evolving application. It, it changes very frequently. And there are a number of different components there, which I won't go into in detail. Maybe the Scenario Builder is the one that's worth uh, having a look at if, you, if you're motivated to do so. It allows you to build scenarios like the one that we have been looking at that uh, that consultation. There's just a screenshot of a few of the uh, of the of the interfaces there. That top left is the uh, starter interface. Uh, bottom right is um, showing uh, it's a real graph there showing a consultation. Forge uh, is the uh, is the main um, profiling tool that's available from Furore, um, based in the Netherlands. Um, it's a very comprehensive tool. It's the one I believe that you're using in the UK at the moment. And Simplifier is a, uh, is a repository, a registry for storing uh, the artifacts, the, the profiling artifacts that are required. Fire enabling your application. Here are a number of ways in which you could um, fire, uh, add fire to the left there as you might want to convert between messages. In the middle there, you might be using fire as your actual native store and a number of applications are doing that. And then over to the right there is where you put a, a fire interface in front of your actual, uh, front of actual database. Transitioning to Fire. So, up uh, here are some of the um, some of the ways you might want to think about moving from where you are now to to a Fire future. If you're using HL7 version two, quite honestly, there probably isn't a lot of demand to move right now. Fire certainly supports messaging, but version two substantially works, and there's there's not a lot of advantage to be gained right here right now. CDA, perhaps more so. The big issue with CDA is that they're simple to, to create, or relatively simple to create, but they're jolly hard to actually pull structured data out of. So unless you have a big investment in CDA, this is an area that you might want to look at. If you have a custom API already, again, moving to a standards-based one is, is, a, is a jolly good idea. And of course, if you have no API at all at the moment, or no way of moving data around, that's the sweet spot for Fire. That's really where you need to be uh, you need to be thinking. So this is the last slide I hope I, uh, I have kept to time. Here is where you can go to find out more information um, from HL7 itself, a number of links there from the community, including Interopen down there. The blogs uh, down the bottom left-hand corner, my own one is, is Fireblog, but uh, Health Intersections is Graham. Um, the Fireplace is Fiore, Brian Postlethwaite uh, does quite a lot, so they are, they are areas. Um, the, uh, the library to the top right-hand side there. Again, if you're going to use Fire, don't try and do it all yourself. You can, absolutely, but there are free, open-source, battle-hardened libraries that will very much assist you on the track, and there are some of the links to them there, other tooling we've talked about, and test servers. Again, haven't really had a chance to talk much about them, but there are today, right now, servers that understand Fire that you can go out and, uh, and just have a play with. So that's what I have to say. I hope you found it useful. Um, if you want more information, um, reach out to some of these sites or reach out to me directly. Thank you very much for listening.